Yes, hello. Welcome to the Family Orientation Digital Conference. My name is Bola Marjo, and I'm going to be here uh, next two hours. And now, this conference is the first of its, uh, is brought to you courtesy of the Climax Family Hub. Now, the Climax Family Hub is a non for profit organization uh, that works with young people from the African community. Of course, uh, in a short while, we'll be meeting the uh, convener of this conference to tell us a bit more about uh, Climax Family Hub, what we do, and why. Now, uh, first of all, let me appreciate everyone watching us for, uh, on YouTube, on Instagram, and other social media platform. It's a privilege to be here, and I just want to say thank you uh, for the privilege of your company. Now, we're going to be talking about select the African community. We're going to be talking about a couple of things, but mostly underpinning all this conversation is mental. Now, never before. Yeah, it's an extraordinary one. And uh, it, it turns out that life would never be the same again as we know it. Of course, I'm talking about COVID-19 and the fact that the greater majority of us in home for a long time. Uh, things that we didn't know we could do without. It shows that we point. Fortunately, we're going to be doing things differently. Now, in spite of COVID-19, there are every challenges that are still ongoing that people are dealing with. So help us. And this is one of the things that people are quite uh, uncomfortable with. Even at global level, is something that when you mention it, people are not so to discuss it, people are concerned about it, people are ashamed of it, most especially in Africa. When you talk about mental health, health that comes to people's mind is somebody's mad. And we all know that even the concept of being mad is a problem. It's actually a prayer for one. People say, you know, people praying against not going mad or nothing mad places and whatnot. But when we talk about mental health, it's not just about we're talking about depression, we're talking about anxiety, we're talking about panic attacks, we're talking about uh, uh, people don't even think are an issue in our side of the world. If you say that you're people ask you to pray, all things. Today, it's a pleasure to have a team of experts from our community that are going to be talking about these issues that are Sometimes when experts talk about issues that affect Africa, there's this issue of distrust. You know, from outside our own they concern, they don't know us, like, they don't know our culture, they don't know our idiosyncrasies, they don't know our, our, our tradition. They are they're speculating into our issues. They, they don't know us. Like. But today, it's my pleasure to say that we have some of the very best brains in the, the industry of mental health, from psychiatrists to, to consultants. So, you know, uh, people working in the third sector. And so, uh, in as well, I'm going to be inviting them so that we can get this conference rolling. So, get yourself a cup of tea, drink, whatnot, popcorn, make yourself comfortable. This is how things are going to be happening now, going forward. One of the people have worn, uh, dressed up in suits and gone to a conference center and, and, and wear hand tags and things like that. But, you know, we're going to be sat in our home, comfortable. The part of amazing uh, conference. So, without further ado, uh, I'd like to be the convener, uh, that's the chairperson of, of Climax uh, Family Hub, in the person of Kevin Tomide Johnson. She's the founder CEO of Climax Family Forum. So, uh, this organization, what they do, and why we're here. Kevin Tomide Johnson. Oh, thank you very, very much for uh, bringing me on board, and thank you for being part of the event as well. Um, like you rightly highlighted, this is the new norm. This is the way forward. In the past, we will have had it in a, you know, you know, in a conference center, bring parents and young people together to discuss these issues that are affecting our communities and to look for a common solution as to how we can better empower ourselves better fortify ourselves to 
number one, nurture our children to become and also to enable them to be the very best they us to be. And uh, basically, Climate Family Hub is uh, was set up uh, about six years ago to bring families and experts in the community together to find a lasting solution to the common problems that we're having in the society. It was found in light of the rise in uh, gang and knife crimes, the dog affiliated crimes that we see among our young people, uh, the rise in domestic violence, mental health issues. And we, we, we did realize that the majority of these things that are going on in the community, we hardly have people who are of cultural uh, orientation as ours in the community to actually attend to this issue. And it is with this in mind that we put uh, Climate Family Hub together to provide support from a cultural and community standpoint to young people, especially people from the African background, you know, where we can speak common language, we can act, we have common identity and we can actually look for common solutions to the issues that we that is facing us following our migration into United Kingdom, for instance, where we operate from. But this also has been extended to uh, Nigeria. We also have a branch now in Uganda, whereby we support young people in making credible choices. Because on the global platform, we see that our young people are lagging in terms of economic, economic development, job em uh, employment, uh, when it comes to health and you know just in every area so climate family hub is just an encompassing it's like a supermarket bringing everything that we can use to build our young people and to sustain a family that will support a child to grow so welcome on board if you're watching us my name is kenny tomide johnson i'm the founder but i'm not just the only one running climate i have people with me that are running it like i have uh, a cov uh I call <laughs> one of our people as well I'll be speaking today, uh, who is uh, the one person coordinating the uh, programs we run in Nigeria, Dr. Chris Olu David. And we have some people as well within the community that are helping us to discharge this. Everyone on board tonight, I will be mentioning names later on, but I just want to say thank you so much for subscribing to be, uh, take part in this event, bringing your expertise and your knowledge and years of experiences on board. We quite appreciate you. And for our viewers, I say thank you so much for tuning in. Today. A lot of work has gone on behind the scenes. And obviously, honestly, you just have to sit back and enjoy as much as you can. Excuse me, as much as you can, because they've got so much to offer, and I believe that at the end of today, we will have a lot to, to bring about. There will be some feedback and question time. Please feel free to ship in as well, and we will we are in for a very good time. Thank you so much for that. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Kemi. That's uh, Kemi Tomide Johnson, the founder and CEO of Climax Family Forum. Quite enthused about the whole thing, you can feel our, our energy and our passion straight away. Okay, so let's get right into it, shall we? Um, at this point, it's my pleasure to invite this gentleman. Now, we're gonna have this in session. This first session is gonna be based on domestic violence and uh, abuse, the mental health and family safety. The theme of this conference is actually improving family safety and dynamics, so hopefully, by the time our speakers come in one after the other, they'll be able to unpack uh, what these words actually mean. You know, if you're not really uh, making sense of it, what does improving family mean? In what sense? In financial sense? In, you know, how do you improve a family? What safety? Dynamics? Hopefully, once our speakers come in one after the other, they'll unpick it for us and we're able to understand it much better. So, um, without further ado, please help me welcome this gentleman who is a, a consultant psychiatrist. Now, he's a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So just so you know, all our speakers here, highly qualified, highly sought after. And so we really appreciate your time. A uh, member of Royal College of Psychiatrists, uh, his academic work has been published in the peer reviews, uh, scientific journals, right here in the UK. 
and cited internationally. He writes column in the newspaper on public mental health, so very qualified for this topic he's about to talk about. And he's also a, a journalist of some sort. He has his own radio show. Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Ayodele Ajayi. He's going to be talking about creating healthier families, children and young people's mental health. Dr. Ajayi, welcome to the Orientation Digital Conference 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for having me. Um, it's um, such a pleasure to be here today, and I do think it's also a great privilege. Um, I also want to say thank you to uh, Mrs. Tommy Day Johnson for putting this together, because I do think this is a very crucial need in our community. So thank you for meeting such a very vital need um, at this important um, period of our lives. Um, so. My theme today is to talk about um, creating healthier families, um, particularly to do with the mental health of young people and of children, our young people and children. Now, the, I think it's very important that we first understand what mental health is um, and why it's very important at this time to look at the mental health of our young people. Now, somebody said, um, Aristotle, who was a Greek philosopher, he said, give me a boy until he's seven years old, and I will give you back the man. The import of that is the very early years of a child's life are very, very crucial to what they become in life eventually. That includes the experiences they have, that includes their education, and that includes even the, the environment in which they grow up. So it's very important to pay attention to our children and particularly to their mental health. But the reality is, what exactly is mental health? Because um, if somebody, if a child goes on the playground and they break their leg and they have a fracture, we know they have a fracture on their legs. We know where that is. We know we can um, put a cast over that. If a child, uh, for any reason, cuts themselves with the scissors, for instance, or maybe they are, they are doing their, their hard work, we know where that is. We know how to address that. But when it comes to mental health, it's usually a problem to put, people have, find it difficult to put their hands on what exactly mental health is. So according to the World Health Organization, mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual is able to fulfill their potential. They are able to cope with the normal stresses of life. They are able to work productively and they are able to contribute meaningfully to society. And so when there is a problem in that regard, then we can begin to see, we can begin to suspect that maybe there is a problem with mental health. And the next question is, what are mental illnesses? Because if we know mental health, then when there's a deviation from it, then we know where mental, um, we can see what mental illnesses are. Mental illnesses are a set of conditions in which there is involvement of the thought, that the thinking is affected, emotions are affected sometimes, and also sometimes behavior is affected. So sometimes it's a combination of this, or it could, could just be one of them. What we do find is that when one is affected, when thinking is affected, for instance, eventually it affects the emotions and it will eventually affect behavior. And the impact, it's not just about the fact that these domains of life are affected, it's also the impact that it has on the individual. So everybody sometimes gets a bad day. Sometimes you hear bad news, maybe you, you went for an interview, you didn't get it. Um, you feel sad about it, but you recover. By the next day or after a few days, you are, you are well, you are back, you are back to form. But it becomes a problem when the problems in the men in, in emotions, problems in thinking, and problems in behavior actually affect a person's functioning, and such that they are not able to function well in their relationships, they are not able to function well in their family life, they are not able to function well in their jobs or they might not even be able to function well in their education. 
when this happens, when there's an impact on, on these areas of life as a result of problems in thinking, in emotions and behavior, then we talk about mental health problems. Now, the question is, why do we need to start talking about mental health problems in children? The reality is that over the last 30 years, research shows us that more and more, even though on the overall, the mental health of children and um, young, young people um, has been static, what we know is that over the last 30 years, it looks like more and more, we are seeing more problems in young people and in um, young adults. Children and young people are beginning to get more affected by mental um, problems, even though on the overall, we find that most children and most young adults still do well. Now, um, the WHO, for instance, tells us that worldwide, up to 10 to 20 percent of children have a mental health problem um, of some sort. Now, let's start trying and put that in perspective. What we are talking about here, here is that if you go into a playground in a school or you actually go into a school assembly, we are talking about one out of 10 children that you count possibly having a mental health problem. One out of 10 children or even two out of 10 children because the, who, who, um, the World Health Organization figures says is 10 to 20 percent. That's quite alarming. And why is that? It's because the world is changing. We know that children are under more pressure. Um, they, they are uh, exposed to um, social pressures, for instance. The internet is one of the, um, one of the reasons that has been cited. The fact that even sometimes maybe parents are not available as well, those are issues that could actually create mental difficulties in our children and in our young people. So the question is, how do we deal with this? What, what can we do as families to help our children? What are the things that we can actually do to help children to have a good start in life, to have, help them to have a good grounding so that they are, they, they are starting off on a robust ground? Um, the first thing I would like to refer to is that children, in order for children to thrive mentally, they do need unconditional love and acceptance. They need unconditional love and acceptance. And that unconditional love and acceptance can come from no better people than their primary caregivers. In most communities, is either is their parents. That could be their parents living together, or it could be one or a single parent family. But the important thing is that children should have acceptance and love that is unconditional. Sometimes in African families, sometimes in Afro-Caribbean families, we are too driven to, um, and we are too, we emphasize so much on outcomes for these children that their mental health becomes um, second class, put, be, becomes put at risk as a result of the fact that the parents are driven. However, it's very important for children to be shown love in a way that they know that the love that a parent has for them is not based on outcomes. It's based on the fact that I love you anyway it's not based on and i'm not going to love you better because you've performed well and i'm not going to love you less because you are, um, you've failed in one area of your life or the other so it's very important that children um, understand this from the outset that um, they have unconditional love of their parents um, and of whoever is the primary caregiver sometimes it's actually it may be the grandparents or somebody else that is able to stand in this role and actually give this love um, um, and actually give this message to children so that their, um, their mental health can be robust. The other thing that we need to know about um, giving unconditional love and acceptance to young children in order for them, for their mental health to be robust, is that we also know that um, affectionate touches, um, giving them hugs, giving them embraces is actually a very meaningful thing and it's a very, very powerful thing in helping the brain of children develop and also their mental health to develop. There is so much research that has been done in this area and every time the, the outcome is that indeed children who are embraced, children who, who have regular hugs, children who have affirmation from their parents actually do better mentally and they do better socially than children who don't. Now, what else do children need in order to develop well, um, to have a um, robust mental health as they go 
into their lives. Children need to um, also be uh, um, enabled to understand their identity. I think there's no other time to talk about the identity of children than at this time when we've got the George, um, George Floyd um, as a um, murder, as well as the um, Every Life Matters, every Black Life Matters rather. Um, this is the time to really help children to understand that their life matters and that the color of their skin has nothing to do with what the, the value they, 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 they've, they've got to give to the world. So we as parents, um, we as caregivers, as mentors, as church leaders, as, as, as our community leaders, need to reinforce this message to young people that their lives matter. And we need to help them to develop a sense of well-being that no matter what their color is, where they were born, how they were born, that they, they, are, they are of value and their life brings and that they are unique in themselves. And we need to also help them to understand that they shouldn't let another person's reality or another person's view of themselves become their own personal reality. They need to determine, and, and, and this is something that we do by encouraging young people, um, by helping them to find their strengths, by helping them to find um, the things that they do well, that they excel at, and also by reinforcing a message of encouragement. Young people um, and children at a time in their lives when they are developing their view of themselves, the world and others. And the parental voice is very important. Um, I do know I'm, I'm about to, I'm beginning to round up now because I know I've got about a minute left. Now, it's also very important for us, um, for caregivers to reinforce this message to young people that um, you believe in their dreams and that you believe in their future. Um, and finally, I think it's important that if there are any signs of um, mental problems or any signs that show that maybe there is a deviation from the norm, it's very, very important for, uh, for parents to seek help very promptly. We do know that early intervention in any mental condition is associated with a good outcome. And also for parents, one of the things that the best, one of the best things you can do for your children, particularly if you have a mental problem yourself, is to seek help. Because if you are not in a robust place to give support to your child, then um, you put that child more at risk of um, developing mental problems in the future. Um, so I would like to, um, I'm sure that if um, there are any questions, um, I can then take that um, um, at the question time. Yeah. Once again, before Dr. having I, me yeah. on the Yes, Dr. Jai, thank you so much for that riveting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I mean, I, I find that quite useful. I'm sure a lot of people will do as well. Before I let you go, as Africans, aren't we in a conundrum? Aren't we, aren't we in, a, in a state of confusion? Because okay. the things that you mentioned here, yeah, they are very ideal. But the, 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 my observation with our community is, even culturally, there are things that I think would probably put us at a disadvantage. You know, how many homes, how many African fathers hug their sons? Or how many, you know, African moms hug their daughters or vice versa? And then this issue of discipline, you know, you, right. you alluded to something that in our community we are outcome driven. So in a situation where you want your son to be a doctor at all costs, and you've spent so yes. much money on private education, you know, there was a video recently that was yes. that went viral. A gentleman that beat his son because of his result that was so bad. You know, and on social media, you see Africans in the UK, in the US, saying yes, that's what that boy deserves. You know, and some voices like mine were minority to say, but what about his mental health? What about his emotion? You know, I digress, but my son once said, Dad, do not live your life vicariously through me. I had to Google the word mm -hmm. vicariously. I had to Google it. That boy had, he had, had that resentment since he was 13. He eventually found his voice when he was 17. He said, Dad, I am not studying medicine. I want to study art. Please do not live your life vicariously through me. So 
I learned very quickly that sometimes we don't even have bad intentions, but our children can be going through a lot of pressure in terms of the pressure that we put on them. So before I digress too much, my question is, where does culture play in all of this? You will hear most African communities say, spare the rod, spoil the child, all this kind of stuff. People will quote Bible verses to justify their high-handedness in terms of enforcing discipline in their home. How do we get, how do we navigate this, this murky water? Yeah. Thank you very much for that question because you've, um, it's a very relevant question and you've brought up a lot of issues actually. One of them is the issue of discipline. What we do know, for instance, uh, what we do know is that consistent discipline, discipline that is car carried out with compassion and discipline that is well communicated is what is effective. So there are three C words there. There's communication, there's compassion, and uh, there's communication, there's compassion, and there's consistency. Now, the way to break that down is that it's important for children to know why you are applying discipline. It's important for them to, it's important to communicate with them and to know what it's in need for them. Um, secondly, it's important um, for you to do it from the point of com compassion, not the point of anger. And um, lastly, it's that it, it's also important for that to be consistent. Now, in terms of a child who, who, um, who, wants, who, who doesn't want to study medicine, for instance, I know in Africa, we all want our children to be doctors and lawyers, but it's very important for us as parents as well to look at their academic abilities, to look, look at their um, aptitudes, to look at their natural abilities and to encourage them in that regard. Um, because they are, they are, the reality is that there are people, I, I have colleagues who are doctors and they are frustrated because they didn't really choose to become doctors. Their parents forced them to become doctors and today they are carrying on living, they are going through the motions, but they are not enjoying life. Um, so I think that's a very, very important thing that it's our responsibility as parents to help children to discover who they really are in life, to help them to discover their natural abilities and then train them in that regard um, and, and help them to actually fulfill their potential to the best. Dr. I, Dr. Ajayi, yeah. thank you so much for that. I'm sure our viewers will have one or two questions for you later on, so please do sit tight and uh, I'll come back to you at some point. Thank you so much once again for that, Dr. Thank Ajayi, you. consultant psychiatrist right there. Now, uh, my next uh, guest also is going to be talking about something along this line. Uh, she's an NHS consultant, forensic psychiatrist, and uh, an approved clinical forensic training program director for Health Education England, Kent, sorry, and Success. Wow, she, she's quite busy. She's an accredited therapist in cognitive analytic therapy, and she's an honorary senior lecturer at the Christchurch University of Kent. So ladies and gentlemen, you'll need a notepad and a pen because we have a lecturer that's about to join us now, and you know when lecturers lecture, we have to write stuff down. So it's my pleasure at this point to invite Dr. Folashade Olajubu to the podium, and she'll be talking about managing the impact of COVID-19 on families. Dr. Olajubu, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to start by again thanking the conveners for inviting me today. And I also want to thank Dr. Ajayi for giving a very insightful presentation. And just to recap what Dr. Ajayi said, he explained to us what mental health is and the difference between mental health and mental illness. And then he highlighted the fact that one in 10 children or young people will suffer from mental health difficulties in their childhood and adolescence. And he then went on to educate us about some of the factors that are necessary to promote mental well-being and good mental health in young people. I'm going to speak um, follow on from that by speaking about managing the impact of COVID-19 on families. And I start off by asking a question and then trying to answer it. Why this discussion? Why at this time? I answer by saying the coronavirus pandemic has disrupted the life of every child in this country. And dare I say every family, no matter what your color is. Although I know that tonight we're focusing on our own people in the diaspora. And it has provoked an unprecedented public health emergency, which has challenged our society 
challenge the economy. And we've not seen anything like this since the World War II that ended in 1945. So again, I ask the question, why this discussion? The reason why I've been asked to speak today is to focus on and link into what Dr. Jai said about the significance of childhood adversity. So we clinicians understand that childhood adversity can have a long-term impact on the mental well-being and actually the progress of children. And there's something known as toxic stress or unlimited stress, and it has potentially permanent um, effects and can be very damaging, and it can affect in three main areas. So if we think about how stressful the COVID-19 scenario has been, for young children, it can impact on three main areas. One, learning, and in terms of learning, it can impact on their linguistic abilities and their social emotional skills. Secondly, the stress of COVID-19 and families can impact adversely on the behavior of children. And about adaptive behavior versus maladaptive responses to future adversity. And by that, I'm bringing in the concept known as resilience. And resilience is a simple word, which means ability to bounce back from adverse circumstances. When children experience adversity at a young may impact ability to bounce back from adversity in later life. And then we understand that in terms of chronic stress at a young age, in addition to affecting learning and behavior, it can affect us physiologically. And it can bring us in the body, which is known as hyperarousal. Now, many of us would have heard of the fight, flight, fright mechanism. And to give an example, if I'm driving in my car, and cuts in front of me, that mechanism um, is activated, allows me to put my feet on the brakes and avoid having an accident. That's good. Likewise, by preparing for tonight, that mechanism has a game and research and get prepared. All very good. However, if you hyper vigilance all the time, it can have a negative impact on both your mental health and your physical health and predispose you in later life to mental health difficulties and physical health difficulties such as high blood pressure and diabetes. So essentially what I'm saying is that childhood adversity can have a lifelong effect on the life of the person who experiences it. So bringing that back into today, what possibly the impacts of COVID-19 on families? One, for many families, there's been a change in family routine, either with parents working from home or parents not being able to work at all. Um, for many parents with um, child-aged children, there is an expectation that they take on the role of teachers and start supporting homeschooling, which can be very difficult. For many families from our background, there are financial challenges and hardship due to the inability to work or working part-time or being furloughed. This, in addition, could lead to tension, tension between the parents in the home. Um, we mustn't forget that as um, black and ethnic mice, the prognosis when we catch COVID is worse. And so for many of us, we've had to contend with friends and close loved ones either contracting COVID or actually dying from COVID. Um, for some of us, uh, we have needed to shield. I know of an individual who has not been able to leave home for 12 weeks because um, he has serious underlying health conditions. Some of us have to self-isolate. I know of a particular situation where a husband and wife have now had to have to live in a separate home. My husband is working and yet the wife has to. And of course, all of these things lead to a worsening of mental wealth for the children and the adults. Sometimes in response to this, what you find is jewels will result to um, substance abuse drinking too much or taking or could be an increase in domestic abuse. Um, it's important to say that there are particular individuals or families who will be even more affected. So those who have an uncertain immigration status, um, those families where for whatever reason they're in social services and definitely families where there is a pre-existing history of chronic physical or mental illness. For children in particular, 
the, co the impact of COVID is likely to lead to less structure and stimulation because they're not going to school. There may be less um, social support and a tendency to isolation because they're separated from school. The children may feel worry, anxiety. There may be genuine fear, fear of dying, fear of a relative dying, fear of treatment. And they may actually develop um, mental illness as described by Dr. Ajayi. And again, sadly, as I've said before, some young people will be exposed to domestic abuse, exploitation, and maybe neglect. So what are the strategies that we need to employ? Well, I'm speaking that out now to the government that there are some strategies that need to be employed. They need to put strategies in place to protect children and families facing financial insecurity as a result of this crisis and preventing child poverty, because we know that child poverty is implicated in longer term mental health difficulties. Make sure that they have systems in place to respond to every child, whether they um, their family were of one's immigration status or not. They need to put um, strategies in place to keep children and young adults safe. And life report, which is undertaken by the Children's Society, said that children and young adults are normally concerned about the following factors. And we as um, individuals in our community need to think about these factors as well. Young people and children are worried about their home circumstances, their family, their friends, their physical and mental health, tend issues around money, their future choices and their physical appearance. And so we as families and parents, we need to think about those factors when we are supporting our young people. So what can family and parents do to support our young people? They can answer to the day. They can support the young people and children to engage in creative activities. They should support the children to engage in regular exercise. As Dr. Jai said, show unconditional love, but also balance that with discipline, which is consistent and underpinned by good communication. They should be deliberate in giving their children individual attention. They should be open in their explanations if somebody's going through financial difficulties or a loved one as well. They should provide um, explanations which are age appropriate. And if deemed appropriate, I know it's a taboo in our families and our backgrounds, but sometimes as parents and families, we need additional support. And for the sake of our children and our young ones and their longer term physical and mental health, we need to feel or we should, you know, access support. In terms for, again, just looking at specific strategies to help children mentally well, in addition to the things that Dr. Ajay has said, we need to help children to remain connected to their peers. We need to support them to keep learning. We need to support them to, to keep active, to keep creative. And I think for adults and children, we need to in, um, take time to understand our identity and the final thing that may not be popular in um, the um, in this popula population, but very important for us, is exercising our faith, whether we be Christians or Muslims. A faith, um, a, an active faith, helps us to weather the storms of life. I just want to end by putting out some helplines that might be necessary. Um, if today you feel that you're fine and they might be struggling in terms of mental health or struggling in terms of physical health or struggling around. There are a number of helplines which are available. I, of course, start off with Climax. As you've heard uh, Mrs. Tommy Day Johnson speak about the service they provide and their contact number is 0757 Of course, never forget that in extreme situations, one can contact the police dial in 999, which is a free, free phone available 24 hours a day. There is a domestic violence helpline, which is also run by Women's Aid and Refuge, and the number is 0808 247. Um, there is a particular um, aspect of the Metropolitan Police, which is for abuse for people within our culture, and the helpline is 0 Two eight eight eight. Um, for men, 
if you think that you are struggling, and I know men find it very difficult to reach out, there is a confidential helpline, 0808-801-037. And the Samaritans is a good helpline for anybody, regardless of in ethnicity. And the helpline is 08457 909090. In summary, what I'm saying is that COVID-19 puts a lot of stress on both the adults and the children within a family. And we need to be mindful that this can impact on both the mental health, both in the short term and in the long term. And again, regarding children, we need to encourage them to connect with others and ourselves, enable them to keep learning, be observant and take notice if they're struggling, encourage them to remain active, help them to be creative, help them to practice their faith, and help them to understand their identity. Thank you very much. So, Falashere, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, you know, very exhaustive and very, very, uh, a lot of information there to, to take away. But before you go, I want to talk about domestic abuse. If you don't mind, just to shed some light further. Now, you know, with most people, when you hear domestic abuse, you are thinking about the punching or the belt or the elbow or the physical, you know, physical attack. In a situation that we're in right now, where children are locked up at home, either because of quarantine or because of the fact that we are all not allowed to go out as much, at least in the last couple of weeks, and couple especially within our community, who usually don't spend that much time together, either because the husband has gone to do his work at night and the wife has gone to do her work in the morning. And then they have this window of hours where they spend together. And they've been doing that for like two decades. And all of a sudden, it's just faced 24 hours, seven days a week. Now, back to my question of domestic abuse. How damaging or how dangerous is the, the, the aspect of domestic abuse that's not physical, like verbal abuse, like neglect, like emotional abuse, like, like, uh, like, like uh, uh, psychological abuse, those bits that you don't necessarily have to physically beat your kids, but when you shout or you raise your voice or you chastise or you say, get out of my face, Get out of my get, get out of my side, idiot. Those kind of things that often happen. I mean, I won't speculate about other community, but I know it's quite you know rampant in our community. And as long as I'm not beating my son, as long as I've not punched him, as long as I've not slapped my but I've called that idiot like one thousand and one times. How damaging are these things? I'm alluding to the things that Dr. Ajayi mentioned earlier about the fact that these things can be can just break. And you really couldn't tell that you hurt somebody deep, deep, deep into their brain because you continue to call them idiots. So much for that question. It's a very important question. Sadly, we know that the statistic abuse have increased since the lockdown due to the um, COVID pandemic. And it's for all the reasons that you so eloquently um, express the fact that people and families, parents are spending more time together. And also some of the reasons that I highlighted in terms of financial challenges, um, a difference to, to life, um, fear, um, illness. So it's like a melting pot. Um, and I think you have eloquently described the different forms of domestic abuse. I think in our culture, abuse, we just think about violence hitting, getting physical, but there are various forms of domestic abuse which include not just physical, but there's emotional, there's um, financial, there, there's, there's verbal. And so you've listed the various types of abuse. And to link into what Dr. Ajayi said, um, and to try and link into what I've said as well, we realize that childhood adversity, adverse experiences in childhood have long-term effects, negative effects on the well-being of a child in the short term and in the long term. So my appeal to everybody listening to me today, to those who have listened to Dr. Jai and those who listen to the speakers going forward, you need to be very mindful. 
when we hit people, but even something that's very common in our culture, verbal abuse or even neglect can have long-term negative effects on the well-being of our children and our young people. Dr. Polashane, thank you so much for that. Uh, don't go away because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions by our viewers and I'm going to possibly have to come back to you in order to just uh, elaborate uh, a bit more. But thank you so much once again. That's Dr. Fulasha Deolajibu, NHS consultant, forensic psychiatrist. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Now, still talking about children and child abuse. You've had a lot of people, especially from our demography and our community, or maybe our age bracket, people will say things like, well, my father beat me. Look at how I turn, turned out. I'm still okay. I was disciplined, you know, people even joke about the kind of corporal punishment that they, they went through and how that changed. They'll be like, it was the beating that I got that shaped me. But earlier in this, in this conference, we were told that things have changed. The world that we lived in then is no longer the same world we live in now. There was no internet, there was no Instagram, there was no social media, there were no cyber bullying. So we really dealt with very minimal uh, uh, pressure. Right now, the pressure is at global level. So with that being said, I'm going to segue nicely to our next speaker. Now, this person has worked in the test sector for over two decades, specifically working with children in the African community on safeguarding and on protection. She's the chairperson of Afri Africa, meaning Africa United Against Child Abuse. It's my pleasure to welcome Debbie Ario. Uh, she's the order of the British Empire. Of course, she received uh, uh, this award based on her work with African families. Africa, I can testify, has done amazingly for the community, being the ears of our community, but also being the mouth of our community. Because most times people go about, we need a voice, we need a voice, we need a voice. We don't just need a voice, we also need an ear. So at this point, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Debbie Ario to the podium. She's going to be talking about domestic and family violence and its impact on children. I hesitated from asking Dr. Olajubu that question because uh, now we want to talk about how it impacts the children. Witnessing their dad and mom fighting and cursing each other out. Let me bring Debbie Ario on now. Debbie, welcome to uh, the, the podium. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for um, inviting me uh, to this program. I think this is a very timely uh, event, uh, bearing in mind the situation that we're in now in relation to uh, you know, COVID-19, the impact on children who are actually spending most of their time uh, at home, and of course, uh, you know, being locked down uh, with their families. So, um, I don't know if you can see me properly. I'm very sorry if you can't. Can you see me properly? I'm trying to, um, yes. I think I can see myself. So if I can, see, I think if I can see myself, you can see me. Um, we can see you there. I'm sorry I came late onto the program. And one of the reasons I came late was because uh, we were working on a, a case of domestic violence involving one of our compatriots uh, in a part of the country. And she's been taken to a shelter where the services being provided by the shelter are actually, uh, you know, appalling, to put it mildly. And so um, this now begs the question, at what point will we be uh, able to provide uh, services for a uh, member community in a way that actually meets their specific, spe specific needs? And I'm saying that because a lot of the shelters that are out there are not actually able to take account of the needs of many of our families, especially families who are of African origin, because they're not run by people who, have of, uh, who are of African origin. And so they don't actually understand many of the issues that come into play when you talk about domestic violence. So, for example, in relation to a family where, there's a, uh, where, where there are children, where there's domestic violence, there's some issues to do with what I would call spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse in the sense that, you know, the, the, the woman has been told that you have to respect your husband. That's what is, is in the Bible. 
in fact, spiritual and cultural abuse. That's what's in the Bible. And of course, you know, the, the, the uh, mother-in-law is calling from Nigeria or from Ghana, from wherever, to tell the woman to behave and so on and so forth. So all this puts a lot of pressure on the woman in the family, adding to the domestic abuse that she's already experiencing from a from a partner. What happens is this: is that when uh, when when parents go through issues, the stress level increases, of course, and these are passed on to their children. So when a woman is going through different forms of abuse, whether it's emotional abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse spiritual abuse, financial abuse, or in many cases, all of these abuses put together, the children also mm -hmm. suffer very greatly. And in, in many cases, we don't tend to think about the children. We just tend to look at what's going on with the mom. But the children also suffer uh, in many, many ways. Firstly, the children suffer because they see their parents arguing every day. And that leaves a lot of emotional trauma in them. They see their, their, their parents fighting or their mother being beaten. That also adds to the emotional trauma. The woman, the mother is going through financial abuse. I, she's not being given money or money is withheld from her. This also impacts on the children because it means that they're not able to get uh, their, you know, food or you know, they meet their needs in different ways. The, children, uh, the, the mother is also going through uh, sexual abuse. So the children possibly can hear their mother being raped, even if they don't see that happening. That causes a lot of trauma for the children. So there are many ways in the, the mother in the family being abused, going through domestic abuse, domestic violence, also impacts on the children. And it's important that we think about, about this, not just in the short term, not just that oh, the child has seen the mother being beaten, but also in the, the medium term, and the long term. The medium term, it can also impact on their own well-being, it can impact on their education, it can impact on their ability to concentrate at school. If in, in some instances, children who see their parents um, uh, uh, who are exposed to prolong, prolonged domestic um, violence also end up, uh, you see that the, the child is uh, not sleeping well, you see that the child is actually wetting themselves. So you can see a 12-year-old child start to wet themselves. And, uh, and in some instances, they might say, oh, why are you wetting yourself, you big boy? Why are you wetting yourself? But this is the aftermath of the trauma that they've experienced from, from being exposed to domestic violence. So those are the, some of the short term, the medium term. In, in the long term, a lot of people actually are saying that a lot of children who are exposed to domestic violence growing up will end up, you know, becoming abusers themselves. Yeah, they will end up beating their own wives. Or they might even um, not learn how to negotiate relationships if they're female, so that they will end up getting married or being a partner to somebody else who is reflective of their childhood. You know, the, you know, how they grew up. So somebody like their father. And, and these are not just kind of like hearsay. There, there's research, you know, to show that children who are exposed to abuse growing up either end up becoming abusers or also continue to yeah. be in abusive uh, relationships. So domestic violence mm -hmm. in relation to children is a form of adverse uh, childhood experience. And, uh, and in this days, practitioners are now beginning to talk about uh, adverse child, childhood experiences and how this impact on the long-term well-being of a child into adulthood. So domestic violence is an issue that we need to take very seriously in our community in relation to how it impacts on the, the, the short term, the medium term and the long term uh, on, on, on an individual, on a child. So um, the other thing to add, of course, is uh, in this COVID-19 period is even much more acute because there's no, there doesn't seem to be many outlets. So if a woman is caught in a domestic violence situation, she might not have a lot of options. So in normal situations, she might be able to maybe run away and go and stay with a friend or a family member. 
here that's not even able to happen because she's stuck at home with her children and so that even as to the um the acuteness of the the experiences that the mother and the children will go through so at this at this point okay. in time which is why it's important i guess for us to be very to keep our eyes open uh, so that if there mm. is anybody in our community or, that we know of who's going through violence in the home we have to do whatever we can to help and support them uh, of course okay. uh, I, I just talked about uh, the case we're currently working on where this woman had yeah. no choice but to go to a shelter now because of some issues the sh shelter said okay you have to leave and so she said to the shelter okay where do you want me to go I, I only have one option and that option is to go back to the person who has been abusing me so that's a double whammy mm -hmm. for this young lady so essentially what i'm trying to say just to round up is this is that it is important that we start to have services in our own community too that can help our own people who are going through difficulties okay. in this country so Debbie, before, nigeria is fine but we also we need to do that here and there, there's a death of services there's a death of services yes. to look after ourselves so Debbie, in this country and that that so that so Debbie, has an additional before, impact on on, fam on families can you hear me, Debbie? Yeah. Can you hear me, Debbie? Sorry. I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, great. So, I mean, you yes, mentioned I can double hear you whammy. Now. You mentioned double whammy. Hello? I'm, Hello. I'm, I'm thinking now, the situation Hello? of transport aggression, which yeah. is quite common in that community where somebody that is a victim herself, a victim of emotional abuse, a victim of neglect, a victim of yeah. financial problem, a combination of everything, as is often the case in our community. When that person now starts to unwittingly abuse yeah. somebody else, so lashing out at, at, at her teenage daughter, shouting at her teenage daughter, transferring the aggression at her yeah. teenage daughter. So you, 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 yeah. you do have a double joke. Yeah, where somebody who is crying for help is now an abuser yeah. of her own child yeah. by, just because she's yeah. suffering. Now, before yeah. we get to a, an ideal situation where everything is in, in place for us to go to, we know that's not the case right now. How do you cope? For that woman watching us right now, who's having a difficult time, she's broke, she's uncomfortable, she feels like she's trapped in this marriage, She's been abused constantly, and now she's lashing out at her teenage daughter, who's probably also trying to uh, navigate her teenage years, looking for her mother to guide her, but her mother is too traumatized to guide her. All she's doing is screaming and shouting and saying, get out of my sight. What's, what's your advice to that woman right now? Mm. Mm. Well, it's important to seek help as early as possible. So, you know, I've talked about some of these shelters and I'm like, you know, look, my own experience is that they're not very appropriate for our people. However, in the interim period, she needs to seek early help. The earlier she seeks help, the better for her and the better for the children. So it is not advisable to stay in an environment where you know that you will be abused because you actually cannot predict what's coming next. One minute, it might just be the bashing. The next minute, it might be something terrible. So for example, even during this COVID-19 period, uh, in uh, East London, uh, a, a, a man killed his own two children because he was so angry with his wife for whatever reason. And his way of punishing her was to kill their two children so it is not advisable when you find yourself in a domestic violence situation it is not advisable to stay firstly because like the short-term issues you talked about but on the long run it will leave long-lasting damages uh, where the children might just find it difficult to struggle um, to you know to to move on with their lives talk less of the mother so it's important to seek early help when you see that you're beginning to, even before you see that you're beginning to lash out, once you know that your partner is laying his hands on you, is abusing you in different ways, you know that that is not an environment that is healthy for you and for your children 
And so it is important to seek help uh, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, so I can, I can see I can see myself making funny faces on the screen. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why that's okay. the case. Thank you so much, Hello, Debbie. Uh, Debbie. Debbie is the CEO Africa, which means uh, which stands for Africa Unite Against Child Abuse. Now um, you're going to uh, grant me this indulgence. I'm going to uh, skip uh, the, uh, the next speaker because of the fact that uh, the, the person we're about to bring in now uh, is supposed to come in much later, but unfortunately, uh, it needs to come in now. Uh, forgive me. So at this point, I'd like to invite Mr. John Woody uh, to the podium to give us uh, his presentation. Uh, John Woody, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself uh, and then tell us what you do and why you're here. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, my time was um, limited this evening. And thank you ever so much for inviting me to talk this evening. Um, some people will recognise me from working in the world of internet safety. Um, I spend most of my life going around schools, talking to young people about staying safe online. Um, my In my past life, I spent 30 years working for the police as a detective, going after paedophiles that would be grooming children. So I'm here to talk about the issues surrounding the internet and I think listening to the last speaker really got me thinking because if you've got a young person in a vulnerable position in a house at the moment then I would say that their risk online is very significant at the moment and if you had a child that was in a bad situation at home previously let's say three months ago before lockdown started when they went to school I think many schools would call that their safe place and they would arrive at school and perhaps talk about things happening at home. Now that safe place has disappeared, what so many young people appear to be doing is finding that online. And that is where it starts getting very dangerous because their safe place online might be anything but safe. So I'm hoping that makes sense. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, if um, you look at what's going on in the world at the moment and this is something that's really focused my mind because traditionally i've always spoke about the risk that our children have of being um, approached by paedophiles online however at this moment in time my biggest concern is radicalization um being drawn into gangs and also being influenced to hold certain views and if you look at the protests going on at the moment over the last few weekends, which are really important protests that are playing out. I think what scares me is there's lots of footage being taken from all sides on the street, on mobile phones of things that are going on. And then what happens is that gets edited and put into the world of social media, but perhaps not the adult world of social media. So young people will see videos on TikTok, they'll see videos on YouTube, highly edited, but they won't understand that they're edited and then that will feed the narrative that makes them more angry and then they start getting involved in a lot more trouble. So I'm really worried about the influence and I don't think a lot of parents are sitting down talking about it. And if you think about the young person whose safe place would normally be at school to talk about things, I think it's really important that parents are mindful that their children don't escape online because if they do escape online and we're not paying attention it could go very badly wrong so i, I hope that makes sense it's not all about pedophiles there's people out there that will see opportunities if you've got a 13 year old young at the moment times are money maybe some domestic abuse going on and that person's got no access to money and then they're being told online by people that, you know, if you um, join our group of people, then we can make some money and then they'll start showing off money before you know it. They've actually joined the gang and never actually walked onto the street to join the gang. So, again, all of the old ways of thinking perhaps haven't caught up with what's happening online. So just as likely to be recruited into gangs or recruited into terrorism online as they would be in real life. But we need to make sure we know what they're doing. That is so, so important. So how do we stop that, John? How, how, do, we, how do we address that? 
the only way, and it, it sounds really poor, but the only way is making sure you have a very good dialogue, dialogue with your children about what their online world looks like. Too many parents have quite a strong view of their children's time online because of their education and everything else. And they might actually be really, really strict and say, you're not going online at all. But young people being industrious will find a way to go online. But unfortunately, if the rule is too tight at home, if they get drawn into something online, are they going to be in a position to talk to their parents about it? And I think that's where things are going wrong. In the work that we were doing in schools up until three months ago, so, so many young people were talking about having access to devices that their parents had no clue about, that their friends had given them, perhaps because um, of not being having access or seeming access at home. And then they would use this device behind their parents' back. Again, that creates a situation where they can't actually... So I think they need to wake up, really realise that the online world is here. It's not going away, but make sure we are part of that journey with our children rather than fighting against it. I'm hoping that makes sense. It really is about sitting down with them and I talking mean, about it. I, I, I'm glad that you're here, John, and I'm glad you're a former police officer. So uh, I, I'm, I'm speculating here. Has there been times when you've been involved in cases with African families have been dealing with their, with their teenage children or young person over issues of uh, age of consent? Now, I ask this question because, you know, working in the third sector, there's been a lot of families at loggerheads with their young ones who then call the police to say, I'm 18, my dad said I cannot go to a party. The police comes and say, this person is 18, is allowed to go to a party. Okay, I've had people tell me yeah. that, times without number, to say that their children called the police on them, the police came and said, you have no right to restrict this person from going out. This person is an adult. He can go out. He can stay out. However he want. If you solve, if you, if you prevent this person, it's, it's false uh, arrest. Yeah. Uh, what do you call it? You know, and that's a problem. You know, so yeah, it is. from the African standpoint, this is where the problem lies. When, when, when families want to watch what their children are doing, want to say, don't do that, what's going on, show me that, They'd be like, I'm 18, you don't get to tell me what to do, I'm going to call 999, and then I'm going to have my way. And we have a lot of families who brought their children to care. How, how, do you, how do you respond to this, John? It's a real nightmare. My experience sort of in dealing with that type of situation always used to concern me because I think culturally we've always run quite a strict line with children which culturally in the past has led to situations where children are really scared of their parents reaction on things and i think um i've done a lot of work in schools in london perhaps um there's one i'm thinking of in wolverhamstow not that long ago that was um a predominantly black school and at the end of the day i actually walked away from the school quite scared and when the parents come along that evening, I leveled with them and said, your children are absolutely terrified of talking to you about stuff because they think they're going to get into trouble. And after that, the parents sort of started listening to what we were saying. So we've got, at a minute, the children are scared to actually talk to their parents about things. And I think it's very difficult to step back from that because there's a very strong hierarchy in the family, which has many, many positives. And I think you would agree with me that, you know, the education of some of the young people is fantastic because of the way that their parent in has held line. So it works in one sense, but we've got to be put on the other side of it that we, where the child has expressed themselves. And once they get to a certain age, I, I forget what the name of the scale is, but as they get older, they're entitled to their own viewpoint. And once they go past 16, pretty much as a parent, although you've got control of money, you've got control of the roof over their head, when it comes to what they actually do, you're really struggling. And the harder line you take, I know it sounds terrible, the less likely then the child is to go to the parent when it goes wrong. And in the old days, I don't think that would have been such a problem because they might have turned to an uncle in the family, for example, or an aunt, and then they would have seen them all right. But today, rather than that, they're turning to these people that we haven't seen 
online or they might be following someone on YouTube that seems pretty cool and get involved in sort of games where that wouldn't have previously ever been open to them. So that's what I'm scared about. And the age, I think we've got to realise that once we're past 16, whether we like it or not, the control bit starts disappearing. So then we need a new skill, really, which is actually communicating with them and being seen as available. That is so, so, so important. Or maybe just giving ground. Just giving yes. ground. Knowing that if you say come back at 7 <laughs> and come back at 9, you can live with it and not, I know. you know, you deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I have oh. a 17-year-old daughter, I have an 8-year-old daughter. Yeah, I've got three children, and I think with my 17-year-old, I had a real harsh awakening at one time. When she was a bit younger, I woke up one day, and because um, I was always really paranoid about her seeing rude things on the internet, believe it or not, and I would do anything to block it, like block, block, block. And I woke up one day and I thought, you know what? I can't actually stop it because I can't control who she's talking to and I can't stop someone sending her an inappropriate picture. So my whole approach to my daughter was sometimes when you're out there, bad things are going to happen or you are going to see bad things or you're going to feel unhappy about things. What I want you to know is if you tell me about it, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get upset with you and we'll sit down and sort it out. I can't promise that I won't be sad about it or let down because I might feel like that. But that's that's for me to deal with, but I promise I'll do the right thing by you. And that's the type of thing we've got to be saying so they know that it's okay to talk about it even if it's difficult. That's amazing, John. Thank you so much for that. And that ties into what our first speaker said about having unconditional love for your children. You know, I feel like as a community, we need to emphasize this a lot more to say, look, Massive. you're going to mess up, but I'm still dad yes. and I'm still mom yes. and I love you of everything else. So talk to me. I don't promise that I won't be cross, but I have your back. I think it's time we start to do that as a community and not just think it's only Massive. Europeans that do this, only Americans that do this. This is what yeah. we're going to have to do because we're dealing with, uh, you know, these children, they're a lot smarter than us. You know, thank you so much, John, for your time. Yeah. Thank, yeah, don't thank you so much. much for me on. I'm sure a lot of people would have some questions for you. Even I, yeah. I might have one or two questions for you in terms of cyber security. You know, so please, yeah. please don't go away. Um, no, I won't. yeah. Thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, we have only a few more minutes before this conference is over. But you know what they say: time flies when you're having fun. I don't know about you, but I'm having a great time. I'm learning so much, and I'm, I'm taking notes as I'm going on. So, um, going on nicely, we've just talked about cyber security from an ex-police officer. Uh, but while still in that environment of e-learning, we know that we are now in a, in a world of e-commerce. E Everybody's every time you log on to YouTube, somebody's trying to teach you how to do uh, uh, sales on Amazon how to make six-figure salaries on Amazon, how to do this and that, how to, how to create a training manual. The list is endless. So clearly, this is the future, whether we like it or not. Only the adaptable will survive. So with that being said, uh, it's my pleasure to invite our next speaker. She's the director and founder of Enrich Learning. Now, this lady has actually been teaching since the age of 12. That's an interesting story that I'm hoping she will share with us very quickly. It's my pleasure to welcome Onye Ye Udokoro. Apologies if I murdered your name. Please feel free to repronounce it so that I can get it spot on. So Onye Ye is going to be talking about supporting remote teaching and learning. Welcome to the podium. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Um, you didn't butcher my name. I'm probably butchering it more because it's a Nigerian name, but British born. I say my name is Aninye Udaporo and I'm the founder no, and no, director no. of Enrich Learning. I started tutoring when I was 12 years old. I'm now 21. And it it's been an incredible journey. I've taught hundreds of children. I started in my parents' living room, God bless them. You know, when I was doing my undergraduate, I taught between 40 to 50 young people in their living room every weekend. Um, whilst I was studying, I'm just finishing my master's in education now. And during the COVID-19 period, I have set up an online school and every single day we have been tutoring children 
Monday to Saturday. Our tuition starts for children from the age of eight right through to the age of 18. And we get a lot of children into private and grammar schools. I myself went to a private school in West Sussex, a private boarding school, um, and I won a, a couple of scholarships and a bursary, and that's how my parents were able to afford it. So that is my short story in short. Um, that is how I, I've kind of gotten to where I am. I'm, like I said, I'm finishing my master's at King's College London. I was the first ever student of the year, just the first ever in history. Um, and I did my first degree in religion, politics, and sociology. Today, I'm here to talk to you guys all about the power of online education. Like I said, I started tuition in my parents' living room, so I wasn't always online. But I won two scholarships to study at Tsinghua University in Beijing a couple of years ago. And when I was there, I noticed they did all of their tuition on the internet, and I couldn't believe it. So I came back to the UK, set up Enrich Learning by myself, set up the website by myself, um, got the very best tutors from Imperial College London, Oxford University, Cambridge University, Durham, um, a wide range of, of, of universities and subjects. And I set up my own online platform. And now we have multiple children in the class at once because my dream is, has always been to provide tuition for parents at an affordable cost. So at the moment, we, if we are actually one of the cheapest in the country, um, but still offering the very best value. Obviously, we have our tutors are at the best universities that there are so how can i help you and and what does life in lockdown and education really mean so i've got three key tips and i'll keep them short and, and sweet because i know that we are we are pressed for time today the first is structure and even though we're stuck at home I've noticed a lot of parents, and I'll be honest, especially in the black community, they've really let structure go. So the focus has been on surviving, but it's not just enough to survive. We have to help our young people thrive. So try and perhaps stick to the school routine that you had beforehand. Get those children to wake up early. You know, I, so many of my students before um, being able to, to start the online school because I had COVID-19 myself. So I, I have experienced having coronavirus and it is horrendous. I, before that, the parents were getting in touch with me saying black parents um, were saying, oh, you know, my child is sleeping until midday, one o'clock in the afternoon. No, 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 no. That is the beginning of the end, to be quite honest with you. Please do not allow your children to sleep for that long. Get them in bed early, get them up at the appropriate time, let them shower, let them have their breakfast, get them at the table doing some work. And I know that the issue for a lot of parents is what work do I give them? Schools, the disparity, the range in terms of what school, some schools are offering is vast. A lot of the private schools, it's school is normal. You know, they're offering online classes. Some schools are offering like homework tasks. Some schools are offering nothing. And what COVID-19 I hope is teaching a lot of parents is that it is your responsibility to educate your child. You cannot be relying on schooling. It, it, it's, it's simply not enough. You know, I, I've been in school, I'm 21. I've been in school my whole life. And what I learned very early on, and I think the biggest key to success for me personally, was that my parents instilled in me that education was my responsibility and my responsibility only nobody is going to do it for you so what free resources do you have bbc bite size is an excellent one especially if you have children in key stages one and two um, they have excellent resources they have Every day they are delivering, you know, a, a couple of minutes of teaching, which can really help um, to um, can really help to at least cover the basics, get the keep the groundwork, etc. So that's you know that's a really good resource. Books, books are massively important. Getting your child to read every day, I find that 
especially amongst my black students, they're not as well read as I would like them to be. Why? Because I don't think parents are spending enough energy in encouraging reading in the household. A lot of parents make the mistake of iPads and, and, and smartphones, and those have a place we are in a digital age so you cannot banish your child from using those things unfortunately you would be doing them a disservice but those things need to be monitored and the focus needs to be on getting your child to read a hardcore book paper you know and if you're not sure about what books to read you can your child should be reading you can google reading lists for that age group or you can seek assistance, you know, just because they're not at school doesn't mean that you cannot contact their school teacher. You are well within your rights to say, I would like my child to be reading some more. What books can you recommend for me so that I can help my child do better? Other sources of really good in, of, of, of really good education and, and, and something that I think we need to really capitalize on is that COVID-19 and the children being at home means that we no longer have to focus on our children simply learning English and maths. There is an education in teaching your child how to cook. There is an education in getting your child to sit down and watch the six o'clock news with you or the seven o'clock news with you and having an understanding of what is going on around them. If you're newspaper readers, there is, a, there is an education in getting your child to sit with you and read the newspaper with you right um those are things that you would not ordinarily have time to do with that child but now we have that time we have no choice we're stuck at home and i really do believe in making it more of a positive situation as opposed to a negative situation the third thing i want to let parents know is the importance of getting support if you have a child that is older and I'm now talking to parents with, with kids who are probably year eight, nine and above, you have to just accept the fact that you don't know that level of chemistry if you're not a chemist. It's difficult. You may not be able to do the maths anymore. The English will be out of your reach. You know, if English is your second, third, so for some people it's even your fourth language, right? I do not expect you, no teacher expects you to be able to understand a Christmas carol. No teacher expects you to understand, you know, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or Shakespeare. Nobody is, un uh, is, is having that expectation of you, but it is your responsibility to put your hands up and say, I need support. And you can get support in several different ways. I'm going to tell you about a couple. One way you can get support is, like I said earlier, reaching out to that class teacher. You have every right to contact them and they have a duty of care to give you and your child the bare minimum at the very least. So they can recommend resources, they can provide resources, they can provide access to revision guides. That is where you, that is what you are supposed to be doing if you're stuck. The other thing is making sure that your child is tapping into the resources that school is already providing. And so getting support may also look like just emailing the teacher to check if they do have online lessons. You know, I will be honest, I have worked with parents recently where some children were telling a few white lies saying that there are no um, school lessons and, you know, they were on the PlayStation all day or they were watching television all day. And in the black community, you know, many of us, we work really hard. So I expect a lot of parents to, for example, be holding down two or three jobs. I know a lot of a lot of my parents are nurses, are doctors, you know, yet they are on the front line. They come home, they're exhausted. They may not have the time to just double check that the, the child is doing on is doing that, you know, the school's online learning. Right. But what I would say is just check. It's really important. And another way to get support is look for tuition if you can afford it make it easier for yourself because right. like i said you're not really going to be expected to know how to do physics or biology that is a gcse or, or a level and so those are the tips i think i would give people in this situation so on yeah basically it's about being proactive as a parent being proactive making that extra effort i'm not just relying on what the children are saying 
or leaving it up to them or just going with the motion. It's literally taking your child's education by the scruff of the neck and taking proactive steps. You don't have to be the one to do it. You can get help from the school or get somebody like yourself to provide online tuition, pay something affordable for it, but at least know that you are taking proactive steps towards your child's education because it's your primary responsibility. Exactly. I think the black community, we need to do better at being proactive with our kids. And like I said, education isn't just English and maths. I sometimes speak, I'll be honest, one of my black students didn't know about uh, the Black Lives Matter campaign. And I asked him why, and he said, well, we don't watch the news in our house. You know, this is something that I, I, I have to convince some of my black parents to watch the news. You need to be doing these things with your children because that is an education that will elevate them in any community. It will give them the, it will give them keys to success. It will enable them to hold conversations with important people that will open the doors to an, to to a new opportunity. Most of the opportunities I have gotten, yes, my education got me there, hundred percent. But actually. It's who I knew and what I said because I had really good general knowledge as a young person that made them think she's sharp, she's bright, let's give her an opportunity. Our she's the black sharp. community, I really want to see us doing that. I really want to see us, you know, educating our children in a holistic way. Holistic way. Right. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, thank you so much uh for that. I believe that our parents out there are listening, you know, it's not just a uh, church or Arabic school, you know, uh, it's important to have general knowledge and this paranoia about news to say, oh, CNN, they are out to get us, BBC, they are out to get us. We need to know what's going on. Thank you so much, Oinye. Uh, please uh, be on standby and I'll, I'll come back to you also. Hopefully, if we can get some questions before we wrap up, because this next speaker is going to do a very quick uh, presentation because this is just moving on nicely. Uh, uh, for, furthermore, this is, uh, his name is Dr. Chris Olu Davis. Dr. Chris Olu Davis uh, is a member of staff of the Climax Family Hub. Uh, is coordinating the Nigerian sector. So Dr. Chris, please very quickly, I want you to just talk to us about promoting resilience and academic excellence without necessarily talking about what Onyinye has alluded to, because after that, we're going to be having uh, a very, very interesting guest from Nigeria. Uh, all of all of our guests today have been outstanding, but uh, this this next guest after Dr. O. Davis is going to be uh, quite an interesting one. So, Dr. Olu Davis, you have the floor. Please, very quickly, maybe five minutes, just tell us about promoting resilience and academic excellence in our children. All right, I'm glad to be with you this evening. I really want to appreciate want to appreciate Kemi uh, uh, for putting this together. Now, resilience and academic excellence. When we put when we put our students in school, what we from there from our children in school, what we expect from them is as a reward, excellence in their academics and them getting the best out of themselves. But more often, more often than not, what I've observed is that most ch children don't know the reason why they go to school. Just like you can, when you know when the purpose of purpose of a thing is abuses abuses inevitable. So, so they just feel like Monday, Monday you Friday you go to school, Saturday you go to church, Sunday you go to church or other places, and then you repeat. Lord, I need for them to put in a lot of effort into their academics. But once they were able to see for themselves that going to going to school because of myself, once I have a dream, dream, and project, project and see that look every i bank i bank take is actually towards achieving a big goal then it becomes a for them they, them they become more committed to their academics they need to have a dream as parents we need to make their future future and let them see that look you are not getting a or b for me it's about you it's about the future it's about what you want to become and then we help them to break their dream in their souls and we also and we also must let them understand that um, result, result is a reflection of your preparation, but not the true measure of your potential. 
So if you actually can examine yourself, look at the reason why you did very well in certain subjects and why you didn't do pretty well in other subjects, if you the, the, the commitment and effort that you put into doing better in these other subjects, into what other subjects, other subjects where you had less debate, then you could actually see that you will see improvement in your academics. And they will, and they will show them to understand, understand that a, a mistake does not equal to a failure. Not that a child, that a child makes mistakes, like most cases, when we look at the result, maybe it did better. It, it had A during the first, uh, Term and the second session, he had B, and you start comparing. This demoralizes the, stu the children, and they just feel like, oh, I'm not good enough. But the, tr but the truth of the matter is, you help the child to look at the reason why. Okay, what did you do differently that make you to fall short this time around? And once you can critically examine this, you see that, oh, I didn't read enough. The last time I saw class questions, but this time around, I didn't just do it. I just have the overconfidence that I could just get it. Probably the mixed class or when you, when you are able to move and then they rearrange them as a failure. And we must consistently encourage our children, you know, to always try to do better than other time, time, not condemn them. All right, Doctor. Hello. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So basically, just to encourage that children focus on the positive and not on the negative. The negative. We should not now. reinforce the yes. negative. Now. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yes. Chris. Again, uh, we have a few more You're minutes welcome. before the show comes to an end. Please, please be on standby. You yes. never know how you are. It's a packed event, and we All have right. a lot of speakers. We have a lot of, but moving on smoothly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. go. this next guest, I'd like to introduce him in a very special way. I'd like to say this. Ejo talo ni moto, be koro lo no dadi shoki fe wole. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite the veteran Galala singer, Daddy Shoki, aka Olorogun John Odafe Asiomo. I'm not going to introduce this man further than that. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Uh, it's my pleasure. I have goosebumps right now. Goosebumps. Because I've been a huge fan of Daddy Shoki since the 90s. I used to try to pop my shoulder up like this. I used to try to do it. <laughs> Daddy Shoki, welcome, welcome, welcome to the oriental yes. conference 2020 it's a pleasure to have thank you, you very, 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 very much you. you have thank you very very much and i am i am very happy to be here too so that very, is your very happy where, yeah where where have you been why have you not been on our tv for quite a while what have you been doing um, First of all, I had a car accident about in 2007 that affected my spinal cord. Oh, wow. So the doctors advised me to slow down because, you know, my dancing, I use too much physical energy when I'm dancing. So they advised yeah. me to relax for some time. So, so that's cannot, why. You cannot pop your shoulder blade off any longer like you used to. Ah, if, if if that is in my blood, anytime they call me on stage, they say I should not do it. But but now they've told me that I'm very okay. I can go back on stage. I'm now I'm back on stage. Wonderful. So that is Shoki. You've been yeah. part of this show. We started. You've heard all the things that we're talking about. Well, we just want to be very... inspired. We want to be inspired by your story because I remember you watching you. You were like the star of Ajegunle. You were so proud that you are from the slum. You almost celebrated yeah. it. Those are what who didn't live in the slum. We almost wish that we live in the slum because of how you <laughs> portrayed it. It never bothered mm -hmm. you. you. You saw yourself beyond the slum. And here you are today, a bona fide mm -hmm. celebrity. I mean, I'm excited to see you, you know? So <laughs> talk to us about how you got this journey from grass 
Success. First of all, let me let me thank the old speakers because I've been following this program all through. And I grew up in the slum. I grew up in a place where people say no good thing can come out from. And what, one thing I learned today, listening to all the speakers, that what we were thinking we were going through was I went through a lot of them too. I lost my dad when I was eight years old and my 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 mom my mom tried but it was not easy growing up in the streets it was not it was not easy growing up very come from a very poor home there was nothing but you need to struggle i even started i even left home i, I left home at about when i was 10 years old you won't believe me i was scavenging looking for what to survive how to survive so but listening to all the speakers today sometimes i wish that i can rewind time i wish i can rewind time and make some of our parents to i don't know if some of our parents will see this program because one thing that touched me with what all the speakers were talking about is the experience of those people that went through abuse violence and things like that it is very hard the, i always tell them that we all that grew up in the street we need to go for counseling we need to go for counseling because the people that you call your role model i tell like everything everybody is saying i've been mean, listening to what everybody is saying the most important thing in life for a child is who the child makes his confidence who the child goes to to tell this is the problem i have that's why the parents you must always make yourself available for your child to be your best friend so that they can share his or her problem with you like growing up from the slum today it was hard because anywhere you go they've they, they've uh, stigmatized you that ah this this is a rough kid it's a rough child he grew up from a rough neighborhood but that did not bring me down because i always have that belief that one day because i started entertainment from my childhood in 1976 i was just six years old when i started entertaining people i started entertaining from the street although although my mother was a teacher i do go to school but the truth is that i have that passion because i believe in i believe i believe in vocational education teach a child how to use it, his hands so that when the child grow up the child will be independent of anybody because most time people don't know some, something that I always tell parents to discover the talent that your child have you have to have two you have to have a third eye a third eye to see that your child is gifted my mom and my grandma because I grew up with my mom and my grandma they noticed that I had talent for entertaining people and they did not they did not bother they just groom me guide me for what to entertain people but you see it was not easy growing up in the slum and i had that thing at the back of my mind that one day this is going to make me this is going to be my livelihood what i'm going to be ending with to let people know that you can come from grass to grace you must you can become something in life if you have that dream and vision and that is where i am today so that is shocky if i if i understand you clearly Mm. All the things that our experts spoke about uh, earlier mm. about things that can damage a child and yeah. you know put them in a place of disadvantage. All those things happen to you because first you yes, lost I your grow dad. Up. You, you, you see, you, you see, you see, you see. Today, somebody, one of the speakers said something. It is very hard for any child that grow up without most of these children today. I tell them like most of them that are in civilized society, they have opportunities that they, they, they don't pick it. We will come from where there is no opportunity. It is your own, it, you, you have to think of what you want to do in life. Today, like when I was growing up, sometimes people will, people will, they will, they will, they will, they will make you feel like you, want, you have to kill yourself. But, but my, my life is just to make people happy. So 
I just decided I must become something in my life. Thank you so much. And because of this determination, in spite of all the odds, you inspired mm -hmm. a whole generation. Recently, I was speaking uh, to a gentleman called Focus Lender, you know, mm -hmm. who also grew up in Ajegmule, who mentioned that you're part of his role model, you know, saying, if Shoki can make you, it, I can make it. You know, you, you know Vocal Slender is like, when people, people always tell me that Vocal Slender is like, it's my story. You see, I was a, I was a scavenger. I started scavenging in 1979. I was nine years old. When I go to, I go to the junkyard, the dustbin, I pick things from the dustbin and go and sell it. And that's where I make money. I, I will gather the money. I will go to the studio. Sometimes I will go to studios. They will drive me. They will seize my money because I come from Ajegule. They don't, nobody want to associate with you if you come from my neighborhood then. But I still have that dream that one day I'm going to be somebody. That was the way I started. There was this program in Nigeria back then called Village Headmaster. Village Headmaster. That was the way I got opportunity. I went on TV and people saw me. But you see, scavenging, scavenging was the only way you can survive if you come from my neighborhood. Because you go to the junkyard, you pick things from the junkyard, you go and sell them like, like what people call recycling today. We have been doing that from when we were small. But music is a passion that I have, a passion for entertainment. And that is why I use that medium to make children from my, from my neighborhood to have that sense of belonging that if John, if John can become shoki, that means me too, I can become something. Because one thing people don't know, it is not your wealth that makes you be a good role model to children. It is not because today, like what, like today, what is going on in the social media? People come and flaunt and flaunt um, wealth, gold, diamond, and all those things. Those things don't make, don't make you be a good role model to children. The thing that will make you be a good role model to a child is for you to show the child from from grass, the way you started your life from nothing to, so, to become something positive. And that is my motto of my life, from get to grace. Thank you so much, Daddy Shoki. We appreciate you. And uh, I wish you uh, a speedy recovery. And I, I, yeah. I hope that everything I'm very well strong. I'm very, very strong, you can see. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, Moving on, uh, as we come towards the end of this program, uh, at this point, I would like to invite a, a politician to join us. Well, we are coming up with these great ideas and all these permutations, all these questions. Policy is at the, at the, at the, at the you know, everything. Policy. Debbie spoke earlier about the fact that it needs to be a facility for our community, you know, that knows our needs and things like that. Policy in the council have to make that decision. So, with that being said, uh, please help me welcome Councillor Susan Jumoke, Fajan Thomas. Please, apologies if I modded your name. I like to believe that I pronounce those very well. She's going to be talking about standing with the youth, reimagining positive parenting and safer community. She's a politician, a community activist, a mentor. She also does some telly. Uh, Councillor Susan Jumoke, welcome to the podium. Okay, so let me move on. Uh, next person is a gender advocate, and she's also a founder of a organization called Code Black. Her name is Kathleen Eitemi. Kathleen is going to be talking about the American surge of rape, incident, and domestic violence. Uh, Kathleen Eitemi, welcome to the podium. Are you there, Caitlin? Okay, well, it's fun. We've had a great time. And uh, you know what they say? Uh, what has the beginning has an end? That's cliche. It's because I couldn't think of anything smarter. 
at this point, I would like to bring Kemi Johnson, the CEO of uh, Climax Family Forum, to come back and uh, sort of uh, give us like a, a you know like a closing remark because I mean we have said quite a lot. Now, if you're listening to what you know, I'm sorry that we'll not be able to take some of your questions, but what's going to happen is you send the questions to this link, and our experts will respond to this uh, to your questions, and so you can come back and the answers. At this point, Temi, uh, Kemi Tomide Justin, please you have the podium to give us a closing remark, uh, appreciation, and uh, we, we bring the conference to an end. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me back and have been following religiously. And I want to say thank you and well done to everyone who has contributed tonight. For those who have experienced technical issues and couldn't uh, participate, uh, I want to extend my apologies to you and this is a new way of doing things and we just have to uh, learn and tag along as we go. Thank you for all our viewers back at home have been able to learn one or two things to strengthen and empower your family, especially your young people further. And uh, this is just a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that is still going to be going on on our website, on Facebook page, uh, Twitter, Instagram, as we do share really uh, parenting tips and uh, ways to support young people as well. And in the coming weeks, you'll be seeing us as well launching our new program, which is specifically targeting young people, helping them to, uh, to, to learn better and to do things in a different way and to help our parents to navigate their children in a positive light, especially in the areas of maximizing their potentials. We want to see young people imagine in the next five, 10 years, in this community, both home and abroad, as leaders in the community. And it's quite important that we as parents do our bit. And uh, you've heard a lot. You can reach us on www.climax.org.uk. Uh, uh, Sorry, I got that wrong. Climax.org.co.uk. And also, you can, my name on Facebook is Kenny Tomide Johnson. Inbox for uh, advices and what have you. Africa is there to help you with issues of domestic uh, abuse, especially with children if you need support. All the psycho, uh, the experts that have been on board tonight can easily be getting in touch to if you reach out to me uh, via email as well, climaxevent at yahoo.com. I will definitely uh, navigate you and sign port you to the right people to help you if you need such support. I want to say a particular thank you to the anchor tonight, uh, Mr. Bola Macho, for your job, job well done. Uh, it's, it's an Otumba and he's done a great job in your professional capacity. We thank you excellently. Thank you for a job well delivered. I want to say thank you to Heritage as well for sharing this. All the people working background, all the members, everybody so far that has contributed to the subsex of to that tonight's e event. I say thank you so much. And to my husband and children who has allowed me time to take this forward and to be able to bring this to you as well. I extend my thank you to them. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Kemi Tomide Johnson, the convener of the Family Orientation Digital Conference 2020. Uh, uh, I regret to say this conference has not come to an end, and uh, but uh, it's not goodbye, it's still later. My name is Bola Hamadjub, and it's been a pleasure to uh, be your compare. Thank you so much for the privilege of your uh, company. Thank you. And